Continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Anne Lang. Anne spent most of her career as a legal editor and managing editor for a DC publishing company that specialized in covering the three branches of government. In her case, this included the courts and administrative agencies like the Labor Department, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. When she retired, Anne began training for the video conference program at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and a few years later for the in-gallery docent program. In today's presentation, she will be discussing the Civil War, which tested and consumed the country for more than four years. She'll explore this great conflict and subsequent reconstruction period are depicted through the traditional mediums of painting and sculpture, as well as the new medium of photography. Perhaps some of these works will give you some creative ideas on how to dwell into your own genealogical resources. So without further ado, I would like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Anne. Thanks very much. Well, as um, Suzanne just mentioned, I am a video conference presenter here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC. This building behind me is the building where the museum resides, along with the National Portrait Gallery. We share space in this building that used to be the original patent office building. So if you ever come to Washington, you can come here. It's not on the mall. It's about, uh, I don't know, six blocks away, easily walkable, and uh, it's a great museum. I'd really recommend it. So today we're going to be talking about the Civil War. I should warn you in advance that I have a terrible cold, and if I have a coughing attack, I'm going to mute myself and black out my camera until I get under control again. But I hope I can get through this without doing that. In any case, so when we think of the Civil War, what, what does that bring to mind for you? I, I, I have to admit that right off the bat, we don't have particular artworks that deal with genealogy. So I'm going to be throwing a lot of information at you that might lead you down different avenues that might help your genealogical research. Um, but I didn't want you to expect that I would be having a lot of information on genealogy itself. Um, okay, so when we talk about the Civil War, what specifically do um, do you think about? What 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 does it conjure in your mind as, in terms of what caused it? Um, you know how how it was resolved, all of those kinds of things. Does anyone have any reactions? Division. Okay, a lot of division, right? Mm -hmm. What was the division caused by? I would say the ethical issue over slavery. Okay, that's definitely one of the big ones, right? Uh, but there were a lot of other ones too. Can can you think of other taxation on the South? Economics. Economics was a big one. Okay, in what regard economics? What what was the big issue? Well, they were what? already having trouble in the South uh, economically, and then when they had the threat of of slavery being abolished, it meant it it magnified that problem. Right, right, absolutely. Any other things that you can think of? Yeah, on alcohol. Yeah, I thought it was partially about states' rights. Right, so there was the issue of states' rights, but it's all intertwined with slavery, right? Because the whole point was that everyone was moving west. There was this major expansion of the country. And the question was, how was this political power going to be divided? Because there was, um, you know, there were the slave states and the free states, and, and how were they going to be divided so that they'd continue to be equally represented in Congress? And there was a huge, well, you tell me, what other things can you think of that were going on at this time? The demand for cotton in Europe was driving um, a, an increase that they had not seen before and bringing it back to the economics of the. Right. And, and also of the North, they needed the cotton as well because they had all the textile mills up in New England, right? So they needed oh. the cotton to be coming up there. So it's not like anyone had their clean hands in terms of the whole issue of slavery. Everybody had their own interests that they were trying to pursue and it always came back to the south and manpower and how were you going to harvest all that cotton and of course the cotton gin came into play too because suddenly they could 
seed the cotton much more efficiently, they could produce a lot more, they could increase the demand for it and all that kind of thing. So it was, you know, kind of a lot of different things roiling together. And on top of all that, you also had the abolition movement that was going on, right? So you had people who were very opposed ethically to the whole idea of slavery, but even the abolition movement was sort of divided, you know, as to whether it should be terminated immediately or whether it should be gradually phased out. So there were a lot of different things going on with all this, right? So, of course, the Civil War, what, what can you tell me about the Civil War itself? Do you know any of, of the factors, uh, the results of the Civil War? A lot of hurt soldiers, a lot of damaged, injured. Right. I mean, over 628,000 people were either killed or wounded as a result of the war. Um, the infrastructure in the South, the economic infrastructure in the South was decimated. Right, right. So there was, you know, things were blown up. Um, the railroads were ruined. A lot of the bridges had been blown up. So there were a lot of problems in terms of even just basic uh, transportation and communication. Okay, so reconstruction. Right, the whole reconstruction thing was another huge element, right? Because there, there was an initial effort to have federal government um, ensure that the slaves remained free and that um that you know elections would be held and all of that kind of thing and it wasn't long i think the reconstruction period lasted about 10 12 years max and then jim crow came into you know the federal government pulled out of the south and jim crow laws started reappearing and uh, had a tremendous impact on the lives of former slaves Okay, let's take a look at our first artwork today. So as you look at this, what's going on here? What can you what what do you observe? Just just initially, what do you see? Underground railroad type of activity. Okay. Now how do you know that? It's dark. Okay. The man is reading a piece of paper. They're waving goodbye to somebody who just helped them uh, get started on their uh, nighttime journey to go north. There's okay. also an opening in the side of the hill there. Right, the so a, a cave or some kind of uh, mm -hmm. place to hide. So there is this, well, how would you describe the mood? They, they oh. look frightened. Okay, some some degree of fear, and you know they're frightened. They're traveling at night, so there's this secrecy and uncertainty about what's going to be happening. What time Hopeful, of day? Though. Hopeful. Okay, and what time of day do you think this is? Early yes, morning. Or sunrise. Okay, somebody said sunrise. Was there another answer as well? I was going to say early, early. Uh, okay, say early morning. Okay, chances are that's exactly right, because um, they would often travel at night, and then once the sun came up, they would hide and until the next night. So there were, the Underground Railroad had this interesting thing where all of the different people involved actually had titles like railroad companies. So you had conductors, and you had engineers, and you had different um, titles like that, so that they could talk about the Underground Railroad without giving themselves away. But they uh, so clearly there was a wagon over on the right hand side where you can see that those people are waving to this guy who is waving back. And these are the, the most recent uh, refugees, I guess we would say, from uh, traveling along the Underground Railroad. So they've been dropped off by the wagon. They're going into this cave to hang out for the day and then they'll probably start their journey again the next morning. So um, the let me just see. So the the problem was that for many uh, former enslaved people or slaved, this is this is actually depicting pre Civil War. So these would be enslaved people. If they escaped and went to a free state, they could be captured and returned and very heavily punished. So they were uh, trying to get out of the country. Many of them were trying to go to. Uh, Canada. Some of them were even going like towards Mexico, but mostly they were going north. 
And they, they felt this urge to get out of the United States because of the danger of being recaptured and sent back. Okay. And of course, when Abraham Lincoln was elected in 1860, there was this big concern on the part of the southern states that he would try to eliminate slavery completely, and that's when they seceded in April of 1861, when the Confederates attacked Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. Okay, so that kind of lays the groundwork for the beginnings of the Civil War. Now let's take a look at some of the initial battle, well, a, a initial battle. So as you look at this, this is a wood engraving from the cover of Harper's Weekly, which was a very influential publication. It came out every week and it had, it always had a cover, a wood engraving kind of cover. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see a little more closely what's going on. So how would you describe the, the mood of this group? It looks very happy. Right, it looks celebratory, doesn't it? Yes. What, what specifically leads you to say that? Uh, the men with their hats in the air and both arms up and everybody seems to be enjoying themselves. Right. They they all look pretty, pretty uh, happy about the situation. They're dancing on the roof of the barge there. You have even African-American people waving their hats. There's a banjo player up here on the barge. So it's there's singing and dancing going on. People from the city, the town have come down to watch the barge. In the early days of the Civil War, it was actually considered a almost an entertainment that a lot of people would go to watch the early battles as though it were a show. They would bring their picnics, they would sit along the sides, but it became clear pretty quickly that this was not fun and games. So this particular artwork is called The View of the James River Canal near Balcony Falls, rebel troops going from Lynchburg to Buchanan on their way to Western Virginia. So there, there was a sense on both sides, actually, in the beginning, that this was going to be a short war. It was going to be just a few battles, and then it would be resolved, and, and everybody could go back to the way things were. But of course, that's not what happened. Um, so let's take a look at another wood engraving that shows a kind of different scene. Okay, this one was done about not even a year later. So that first one was done in September of 1861, Harper's Weekly. This one is in the July issue of the uh, of 1862. So what what has changed? What's going on here? The only word that comes to mind for me is ferocious. Ferocious. All right. What specifically? Violent. Yeah. What what do you notice that makes you say that? the horses yeah the horses are so fearful they're pulling back right the horses are rearing there you can see the whites of their eyes mm -hmm. um what else the horse is trampling a man right they're trampling this this guy is getting squished what else uh it looks like one side is winning over the other the you know the it seems like the people coming in from the left are more aggressive than the ones on the right. Okay, and part of that might be that this is actually a cavalry charge, so that I think the horses are all moving in this direction. So I think that's what's happening. And of course, you know, the horses are rather fearsome if you're on your on on foot. But you can see that there's all kind. I mean, just look at the faces. They're, we're not happy in dancing anymore, right? You have these rather. Um, you know, fierce looks on faces. You can see that this uh, threat to each other, this guy looks like he's going to stab this guy. Um, as we said, this one is getting trampled. So there's a lot going on with all these swords and uh, scabbards and um, daggers and, uh, and rifles and all kinds of stuff. And you can see the gunpowder swirls of smoke up in the sky here. And you can see the cannon and all the bayonets. So it's a sort of a realization that 
uh, this is not going to be a quick and easy war. It's going to be a drawn out and rather gruesome battle. Um, this was done, well, let me give you the title. It's the War for the Union, a cavalry charge from Harper's Weekly, uh, dated July 5, 1862. So as I said, not even a year after that first, that first wood carving. So this is done by Winslow Homer, who um, spent a lot of time with the Union troops uh, and covered some of the battles. Most of his, paint, uh, his wood engravings and paintings are of camp scenes um, and you know before and after battles. He rarely did actual battles, but um, he he, um, he covered the war for Harper's Weekly, and then after the war, he came back and did a few paintings uh, during Reconstruction, and then he kind of retired to Maine, uh, Prout's Neck, Maine, where he did all of his more uh, well. I don't know if they're more well known, but his you know, his breezing up the sailboats and the um, snap the whip, the kids playing in the one room in front of the one room schoolhouse and those, those kinds of paintings that are more bucolic and calmer. Um, I think he had a hard time with the war. Anyway, um, let's take a look at one individual soldier. So this is again another um, Winslow Homer. And what do you notice about this one? Sharpshooter. Okay, he's so a sniper. A sniper, right? He's up in the tree. He's sniping at the enemy. Does it look like he, um, like, what kind of, how long does it look like he'll be up in the tree? Quite a while. And what makes you say that? Well, I see a canteen there. Right. Right, so there's a canteen. He's got himself braced against a branch. He's trying to, you know, keep an eye on who, uh, enemy officers, most likely. But you know, it's a hard business being a sniper because they were not. Um, some people felt that there was not a fair way to fight; that they were hiding in the trees and and taking out people. Um, so that even on their own side, there was this kind of uneasiness with the role of the sniper. But notice also in this wood engraving how he has this man involved with actually taking aim through a rifle at a fellow uh, person from the same country. So you have that whole brother, father, brother battles going on, cousins. But even, even if you didn't have immediate relations, you also had just the fact that it was another fellow citizen. And uh, and so you have this man-made uh, thing, which is kind of chilling to think about, but also the nature. Look at look at the way Homer has depicted the tree. So you've got all this really detailed bark work and the needles of the pine tree and all this kind of stuff. And it, and you think, wow, what a contrast that is. And notice that this hand is so white it just pops out at you because it's all by itself in, in its uh, in its whiteness. Okay. So this is called the Army of the Potomac, a sharpshooter on picket duty, and this was done in 1862, so pretty early on. So, in addition to the way battles are portrayed or the way different soldiers are portrayed. There were also efforts to show landscapes. So let's take a look at a landscape and see what you think this kind of tells us about the war. So when you see this, what, what does it bring to mind? Ruggedness. Okay, ruggedness. Peacefulness. Peacefulness, okay. Isolation. Isolation, right? Because there are really there are no people in this at all. I don't think. I, I have a close up of this. Oh, it's well. It's called the Iron Mine, Port Henry, New York, done in 1862 by Homer Dodge Martin. So it's an oil painting, um, and it's showing. Well, what do you think it's showing? Well, it already I already told you that because it's an iron mine, right? So you have the tailings of the iron mine. So you have this rusty. 
effect coming from the various mines that are in this hillside. So here's a close up so you can see that there was a, a little house at the bottom and a barge. If I go back so you can see, it's this part right here. Is there anything else that this conjures up for you in terms of just the way it looks? It's not a traditional, beautiful landscape. Right, nothing's green. Right, I mean, there are you know, a few green trees up here, but the rest of this is pretty desolate, right? It's just mm -hmm. showing the, the devastation that has occurred on the landscape as a result of the mining. Some people see this as almost uh, metaphorical for wounds that these are like bullet holes and the, the tailings are almost like blood. Um, but really what this is showing that this is this particular mine was one of the richest veins of iron ore in the Northeast. And it was responsible for making, you know, providing the iron that was used for railroads and oil mines and oil fields were all scenes to paint because they provided this advantage to the north in terms of natural resources. So you can see that this, in fact, at the time this was painted, this mine was pretty much done. It had, it had been pretty much mined out. And so there's not a lot of action going on, even though there is the barge and the little house down at the bottom. It's basically done. But um, it did provide all the steel for the railroads, for the armaments, for the cannons, the rifles, all of that kind of thing. And it was able because the railroad, they had such an advantage with the railroad, they could move raw materials to factories and um, and carry men back and forth too as a result of the of the railroad. So the the north had a very high advantage in terms of natural resources and uh, industry. So this was also a time when photography was just developing. Um, when you think about photography today, how many pictures of you uh, have you had in your life, would you say? Many. Many, because everybody has a smartphone and they take pictures constantly, right? Not to mention all the school pictures and wedding pictures and all the usual kind of pictures that people have. But at the time, photography was just beginning. And so it was somewhat limited in terms of you know, how how many pictures people had. Often they only had a single picture of themselves, if that. Matthew Brady was one of the initial big photographers. He set up studios in New York and then in DC. He took celebrity photographs. He, he would also use an immobilizer that would hold your head steady so that you wouldn't have blurriness as a result of motion. But he wanted to document the war. And so he sent some of his photographers down to do it, but it was a slow process. It was not like an instant picture. You had to set up with your, well, uh, your flash and uh, under the, you know, the piece of fabric and um, try and keep everybody st steady so that they didn't blur the picture. So there were very, there were no action shots actually, because it was impossible to capture. Things were moving too fast. And it was dangerous too for photographers to be standing out in a battlefield, right? So he often took pictures of things like regiments, camp life, and then some posed scenes. So let's take a look at one picture here. So what do you think is happening here? Looks like someone's comforting somebody. Okay, so it looks like somebody's taking care of somebody. He's offering him a canteen, right? Do you think these people are on the same side of the war? No. No. Okay, so their uniforms look different, right? I mean, one has a kind of traditional kind of caped coat, pants and boots, and this one has kind of a very different looking uniform. Let me um, tell you a little bit about, well, first of all, just compositionally, the photographer set this up so that everything would point to the sick soldier, right? So all these diagonals and verticals are all pointing right to him. And so in some ways, it's very um, soothing to realize that somebody is helping and taking care of somebody who has been injured. 
In fact, these probably were on the same side. There was a group of soldiers called Zoavs, and they were, um, they had been active in France, in the North Africa, French troops um, that dressed like this in these kind of baggy red pants with spats and a short jacket and the different kinds of hats or fezes. And um, they were popular. They, they became very popular in the United States so that there were Zoav troops on both sides, the, the North and the South. So chances are good that he's on the same side and that he's just, you know, it was a separate um, brigade or, or whatever. So um, let's see. So why do you think it would be important to show rather than just one sick soldier by himself? Why, why is it important to show more than that? More people in the photo tells a more full story about what your right what right. your impression so, is yeah so if you just saw him by himself you wouldn't know if he was alive or dead you wouldn't well, accept that i guess he's sort of upright but um but at least this was very um people at, on the hope front really appreciated pictures like this because it made them realize that their loved one who might have been injured at least was not alone, he was being tended to. So there was that sense of camaraderie and support. So people appreciated that a lot. Do you think this picture was posed or spontaneous? Posed. Right, chances are very good that it was posed. Again, because of the things I mentioned that you couldn't take spontaneous pictures because it took a long time to set up everything and to not have people move. So they had to pose for a while. So some people always talk about whether or not um, pictures are more accurate than paintings. Do you think they are? Yes, just because they take less time to do. Generally, but in this time, there was that 10 minute lag time, say. And so, um, you know, for if you've seen those other pictures that Matthew Brady's studio was responsible for, Alexander Gardner, the ones with the bodies laying in a row or the, the you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to think what else. They, they have a lot of ones with with various soldiers, many just that, that lined in a row, but also kind of in awkward poses with their rifles and stuff. Um, many of those were posed and had to be posed because if they, you wouldn't get the same impact. I mean, he what he was trying to show even though he doctored it somewhat, it's like Photoshopping today, right? He put together um, sort of an unrealistic look, uh, but it had a tremendous impact when you saw all those bodies lined up. So whether or not it's any truer than a, a photograph, it's open to debate, I mean, to a painting, because both in, involve artistic license in terms of how they want to project the image. I wanted to just show you a couple other photographs that have been uh, that we have in our collection. So here's one of the of a steamboat during the war in uh, Chattanooga. Here's a group of a New York Seventh Regiment. So you can see that they had to pose all these guys. Here's an unidentified officer. Well, one other big use of photography was mil uh, medical. So they would show things uh, that this this contributed a lot to the advancement of medicine during the Civil War because they took photographs of amputations. This one, I don't know if you can make out, but is he was shot in his uh, lower abdomen. And you can see in the mirror the where where the bullet came out. So there were all kinds of photos like this. Um, so the, and, and also the, I meant to show you this one, I'm sorry, um, the, the earlier one of just the soldier by himself, they called these carte de visites, which is calling cards. So they would, you know, often would have their pictures taken before they went off to war to give to their family and friends as mementos in case anything happened to them. And then there were also pictures of 
their wives and children that they would carry with them as little mementos. So they would have something to uh, look at at night. Okay. Okay, so now let's turn to a, a different subject and a different medium. So this is an oil painting. I'm going, I think I have this lightened up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so what do you think is going on here? It looks like he's reading maybe the Bible. Okay, yes, he is in fact reading the Bible. Um, what else do you notice about him and where do you think he might be? He's hiding in somebody's basement. Perhaps? Okay, we don't we don't know exactly, but it's clear that there's a, a kind of a rough hewn yeah. wooden cabinet over here. Uh, it seems like there is a fireplace or something here. There seem to be embers and logs and such. He's sitting there with his back to the fire, maybe warming himself and reading. So this is an African American subject, right? Who um, this was painted shortly after, just a few months after the Emancipation Proclamation. And it's a, a humble black man who is reading the Bible. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it was illegal in many states for African Americans to know how to read or to be taught how to read. So the fact that he's reading is all by itself sort of a political statement. Then notice what he's sitting on. Can you can you make out what it is that he, he's uh, sitting on? Is it a box? Well, it's hard to tell exactly what kind of furniture it is. I was referring specifically to this fabric behind him. Can, can you make that out at all? I see the fabric, but I can't tell what it is. Okay, so it's it's blue, right? It's, it's it looks like a blue, some kind of blue with red trim. So we don't know if this is a, a uniform, perhaps a union uniform or a army blanket or something like that. But it's clear that he's involved with the military in some form. So many uh, African Americans fled from their you know wherever they had been on plantations or whatever and fled to to the north or fled to Northern troops to join on the Northern side for, and of course this was right after emancipation. So he may have already been emancipated. The interesting thing is that the title of this is the Lord is my shepherd. And this was done in 1863. The artist is Eastman Johnson. And um, the Lord is my shepherd is from the Psalms and the Psalms are mostly are in the middle of the Bible, right? This looks like it's kind of close to the beginning of the Bible. So there's speculation that in fact, even though it says the Lord is my shepherd, that he may in fact be reading a part on Exodus and let my people go, which might not be quite as calming to um, some folks who would not be keen on having African Americans reading to begin with, but then what they were reading might be of interest as well. Okay. Now let's take a look at another wood carving. I, I know I have a, a lot of these wood engravings, but some of them I think are really, really interesting. So this one is, uh, we don't know who the, oh yes we do, Edwin Forbes did this one. And a, and this is from a book called The Soldier in Our Civil War. So what can you make it out is going on here? Looks like the military is escorting people. Okay, so you can see that there's a, a soldier on a horse here that looks like he's escorting and this one is on foot. Looks like he's got a stick. Maybe he's herding these goats and sheep and things. But if you look back up the hill, you can see this is quite a long wagon train of these kind of Conestoga type wagons. So what do you think may have happened here? Uh, there are fleeing, bacon. fleeing. Yeah, fleeing. I'm sorry. 
They're fleeing. Leaving the town. Uh -huh. Okay, so maybe they're fleeing. Okay, so let me just show you the title of this one. Well, let me show you a close up first. So, so what else do we have going on here besides the sheep and the goats? Uh, oxen. So they're they're going for good. It looks like they're taking everything they have. Right. It looks like they're taking everything. Um, what about this? Parasol? There are no women there. Right. There are no women. And that seems unusual considering the parasol, right? Because I usually associate parasols with women. So in fact, this one is called The Invasion of Maryland, 1864, driving off cattle and plunder taken from farmers by Early's Cavalry. And it's from that book, The Soldier in Our Civil War. This was done towards the closer to the end of the war, 1864, and was done by this artist, Edwin Forbes. So what we have here is that the cavalry operated independently from the infantry. They, they were more mobile, they could travel greater distances, but as a result, they would lose touch with the supply lines. And so they wouldn't necessarily have food, they'd have to get their own food. And so they often raided farms to get their food. And so that could explain all these animals that are being driven off. The other part of that was that the, um, this was uh, the invasion of Maryland. So most of the battles during the Civil War actually occurred in the South. And so, but Virginia, for example, had, had taken such a beating from all the battles that they had had that they, um, at, at one point, they decided to invade Maryland to get some fresh fruits and vegetables and meat, but also to kind of um, maybe cause some panic and fear on the part of Maryland. Maryland was a border state, probably had split allegiances. Some people might have been more in favor of the of the um, Union. Some might be more in favor of the Confederates. But the fact that the Confederate cavalry um, invaded them and took all their stuff and carted away wagon loads of, of stuff, whether it was food, whether it was china and silver, whether it was money, tools, I mean, who knows what all was in all these wagons. How do you think that made the Maryland farmers feel? Anger. Bad. Right. I would guess that you would be really mad or frightened, right? I mean, to think that this, this uh, crowd of cavalry could suddenly appear on the scene and make off with everything you owned, um, that it would it would really infuriate you or f scare the bejapers out of you. So, I mean, it's it's kind of a mixed bag. And, and it, particularly because of that conflict that many Marylanders felt in terms of which side of the war were they actually supporting. But to have this invasion of their personal farm was just like over the top. Um, and this we think is probably a wagon that had been used by the farmer's wife, but they took that as well, including her parasol. So, okay. So I also wanted to point out a couple of things that how, how the war affected places that were not particularly involved in the war other than through their soldiers. So when you look at this painting, what, what uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, this is another wood engraving on paper. What's going on here? A day at the beach. <laughs> okay, well, it does, it does look like a day at the beach, right? You can see the kids down here playing in the sand. You can see water and boats and all that kind of stuff. But looking at the main characters. He's missing an arm. Right, he's missing an arm and, and his jacket is tucked in. They're fairly well to do by the clothes that they're wearing, especially the woman. Right, okay, so so she looks pretty well off at least. And he looks like a returning soldier who has lost his arm. If you look at their faces, how do you think they're interrelating? They're grim. Okay, grim, why do you think? No smiles. They don't look at each other. Right. So what do you think they might be thinking? Ooh, they look pretty serious. Yeah. 
So say say they were, I don't know, husband and wife or fiancés or, or something like that. And he goes off to war and he comes back and now he's missing an arm. How has that changed everything? Well, he wouldn't be able to make as good of a living. Right. He's going to be limited in what he can do in terms of his profession or his um craft or whatever it is that he does, whether he's a farmer or a, a carpenter or whatever it is that he did, banker, who knows. Um, what about her? The pictures look like um, there's a role reversal. Okay, so explain that a little bit more. Well, um, she looks like the stronger person of the two. It wasn't traditional that women would drive a carriage. Um, and women typically in wartime do have to be the strong ones to carry a load. And he is less able to care for himself is what this portrays. Okay, good. Yeah, so, so you can tell that um, she has taken the reins here, literally and she is driving the horse. It's interesting, isn't it, that it, they don't show too much of this carriage, but you know it's a horse-drawn carriage because of the reins and the whip and the, you know, all the wicker and everything. But but anyway, yes, so a very strong role reversal and, and probably a dashing of expectations, right? So she probably was waiting for him to come home and take over doing a lot of these things, like tending to the horse and driving the carriage and taking back some of the farmer's uh, or whatever, whatever craft he was involved in. What about him? How do you think he feels? He's not very happy. No, I'm sure it must be quite a blow to his ego and to knowing that she's as disappointed as she appears to be, that, um, you know, things are not going to be the same. He can't do as much as he used to because he only has one arm. And now he has to uh, you know, let her do the driving. So there's a lot of role reversal and, uh, you know, disappointment, un, you know, unexpected um, hopes dashed and that kind of thing. So this one is called Our Watering Places, the Empty Sleeve at Newport. So this is Newport, Rhode Island, right? So that's why you have the beach and you have the um, sailboats and all of that. But and again, this is from Harper's Weekly. This is dated August 26th, 1865, again by Winslow Homer. And um, so you can see that this has really had a dramatic impact. And, and even on a state that had almost no contact other than sending troops off, had no contact with battles or anything. But the impact of the war was dramatic. It really had a tremendous impact on, on the survivors. Okay, here is another post-war scene. This is a sculpture. What do you think is going on here? Um, well, you can see what appears to be probably a slave right there on okay. the left hand side little boy yes uh -huh. and uh i don't know that might be a bible okay so it could be so what do you think the relationship between the man and the woman is husband wife okay with that's their little boy so that that would be my first guess too but that's not what's happening well the children don't look scared no. Well, the, the little boy hiding behind the skirts might look a little scared. Um, that could be shyness. Right. And he's littler. He's littler than, than the African-American boy. But notice the difference in their clothing. So this boy has shoes and his clothes are intact. This one has no shoes. And you can see that he's basically dressed in rags. So chances are this is um, this was done in 1865 as well. But what do you think is going on between these two? 
What can we tell about the man just looking at him? Oh, he's in uniform. Okay, he's in uniform. Is he telling that lady that her husband has been killed? Maybe, but but look at the, the Bible. So what do you think is going on with the Bible? It looks like she's uh, swearing on the Bible about something. Okay, good. That's exactly what's happening, uh, happening here. This is called taking the oath and drawing rations. And this is a little sculpture. It's only about two feet tall. John Rogers did a whole series of these things. And it, th this was one of his most popular. This one was done in 1865. And it, it's showing the relationship between a union officer and a Southern woman who in order to get rations, now she may be widowed or maybe her husband hasn't come back. Well, yeah, I guess this is after the war. So either she's widowed or he may be uh, injured. Um, but in order to get rations, she has to swear on a Bible, an oath of allegiance to the union. Otherwise she doesn't get the food. And they, the Southerners had to take oaths of office, uh, uh, oaths for, a lot of different reasons. If you wanted to get a pass to leave town, if you wanted to set up a business, they were always taking oaths of allegiance to the union. And so this shows, I think, the the how it, this must be very hard for her, especially if her husband was killed, that she has to now swear allegiance to the union that caused his death. What about the officer though? I mean, if you look at him, how how would you describe his um, mood or attitude in this? Well, it looks like he's taking off his hat maybe in, in, in respect. Right, he's doffing his cap, right? So he understands what she is going through, but that he has to do this anyway, that this is required. And what about the little African-American boy? What do you think he feels about all this? He's probably wondering if he's going to get anything to eat. Right. Could be that, right? It could be something as simple as that. Now, he's probably recently emancipated, but what does that mean? You know, to be emancipated, so you're no longer a slave, but if you have a family, you're probably now a sharecropper. So things haven't really changed very much for him, right? So he's still poverty stricken. He still has uh, poorly, uh, poor clothes. Um, and probably struggling for food. So he's probably just kind of wondering what's the big deal here. You know, it's hard to tell exactly what he's what he's thinking. But I, I think it's a really um, emotive kind of sculpture. And, and as I said, this was one of John Rogers most famous or popular. This okay. is, there's another yeah. thing about that picture. Yeah. Look how small her waist is. Yes, it's true. It's true. That looks really impossible. So we don't know if that's a corset or whether she's starving or, or what exactly. But yeah, it could just be the, the way the corset is or or the way the artist portrayed her. Could be fashion. Right, right. Could be fashion. Okay, let's take a look again at another painting, again by Winslow Homer. He was very prolific during the war and right after. So I'm going to show you a lightened version of this as well, just so you can see it a little more clearly. So what do you think is happening here? It almost looked like, like they're listening to her say something. The, the, the white woman? Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's hard to tell whether she's actually talking, whether any of them is talking. They just seem to be in this staring contest. Um, where do they seem to be? They're inside, door is closed. She, the European woman is holding a rifle, kind of leaning on it, if, if I see that right. Um, well, and it, it seems like a very somber mood. Okay, it's a somber mood, right? Ne neither of them really is comfortable in this setting. So as you look at the four, uh, the, the four African-Americans on this side, what's their mood towards her? 
it looks like they're they're just listening okay. or questioning um, looks. It looks and and the woman okay. in the blue, oh I'm sorry. The woman, um, the European gal is wearing black. So I would make the assumption that she might be in mourning. Okay. Um, yes, it could very well be that she is a widow and perhaps this is um this is in the south winslow homer went south after the um after the war was over and after this was actually done in 1876 <laughs> 76 so that was when reconstruction was kind of you know coming to an end it, so it, it looks like she's telling them something that they can't believe Okay, so maybe they look a little dubious or, or you know. Well, I think she's probably telling them they've been freed and they have no idea what that well, means or what to do with it. I'm wondering if, if she's telling them they have to leave her property now because she doesn't own them anymore and she can't afford to have them be on her property or something. Yeah, right. that's a possibility too. Right, that could be it. Or she may be trying to negotiate with them to do some work that they used to do as slaves, but now she would have to pay them or trade with them. You know, you can stay here another month or you can, you know, pay me in crops or something like that. But I need you to help me in the field or to do some sewing or to do some cooking for me. And so, the, you know, but now she can't just order them to do it. She has to ask them. And so it's really changed the whole power dynamic between these people. You can see that this uh, this woman here on the sitting is sitting. She did not jump to her feet when the woman came to to call because it, it seems that they're in the what used to be slave quarters. Um, you know, it's a, a rather rugged little cottage with just a couple bottles up above a rough hewn door. No, it, it looks. It also looks like it's four generations of women. Okay, yeah, could be, could be four and, generations. And I, I don't know if this is a slave quarters. I never saw a slave quarters that had a fireplace like this over here. Okay, it well, might be that they're in the basement of her house. Okay, maybe that's it. We don't know for sure. What's interesting about this is that when Winslow Homer originally painted this, he um, he painted it with a, with the the white woman carrying a carnation or a rose, some kind of flower. And you can see just this when they cleaned it, they realized, oh, look, at there's a little red here. They think that her hand was actually holding a flower. And then he rethought it and thought, nah, that's not the mood I wanted to convey. I wanted to show this tension between her and and her former slaves this is not a rifle it's like a uh i think a fan or a purse or something that's dangling from a, a string here and then and and then is but i, I it, it does look like a rifle i have to grant you that but it, it's not is it a broom what i don't think it's a broom i think it see it's wrapped around her fingers and it has this string. So I don't know if it's a, you know, a purse of some sort or a, a fan. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is. But I thought that was interesting when they came upon that um, discovery about the flower and how uh, Winslow Homer changed his mind and painted it over. And it wasn't until they were cleaning it that they realized, oh, look at that. But you can see that, you know, the faces are very dubious. One other thing that I wanted to point out on this one is that there's a wedding ring. I don't know if you can make out that little gleam of light there. So suddenly African-Americans were free to marry. And so, you know, we don't know exactly what the status is, whether she just happened to have that ring, but a lot of art historians have looked at that as, as a major advancement. Now, it's not to say that they're not still poverty stricken. You can see all the patches on their clothes you can see that you know life is hard but um but they at least have their freedom now now how free they are is is open to question because if they're sharecroppers or whatever and still living on her prop property as as somebody said she she might be asking them to leave okay so i have one more that i wanted to show you quickly and oh, this is the visit from the old mistress. This was done in 1876 by Winslow Homer. Okay, so the last one is this. 
Now, when you look at this, what, what do you think is going on here? And well, this is a face within a face. It looks okay. like. So you have the two silhouettes superimposed on what looks like one of those wood etching engravings that we've looked at a lot of. Um, what else do you notice? Looks like um, it's the life of somebody, how they were a they were young and what life looked like when they were young, possibly. And then as they grew, it's through the lens of an older person and um, working together, maybe, what I'm seeing in the center. Right. Um, so, so it's interesting because this artist, this is pretty current. This was done in 2005. And she took what was a Harper's Weekly um, cover, and it shows let me let me put up the uh, I was going to let me see. So it's called the Exodus of Confederates from Atlanta from the portfolio Harper's pictorial history of Civil War annotated. This was done in 2005 by the artist Kara Walker, and she used offset lithograph and screen print. She was um, she took this historical engraving and then superimposed her own silhouettes. So she blew up the um, the cover and made it large because this is do I I don't have the measurements on this, but it's a pretty good size. And then used what was a very popular 19th century art form silhouettes, and put two of them. So she has the the girl facing in this direction, looking to the right, and then this one looks more like a man looking to the left. And then it's almost like a keyhole, so you can see a little bit of what's going on in there. Let me see, I think I have a close up, yeah. So can you make out what's happening? Uh, it looks like, it looks like on the top, it, it, there's a, uh, an African-American man and a Caucasian man on the top, but it's right. hard to tell. Yeah, so, so it, it looks like they're both working together to pull up all these belongings onto this cart is pretty heavily packed. And you can see that most of the people in the circle here are white, only this one African American. On this side, we have a few more African Americans who are bringing, it looks like baskets of food. And uh, let me go back to the main one. So you can see that they're packing up to go. They're taking furniture, they're taking food. So, um, so uh, Kara Walker, the artist, superimposes these silhouettes on top of the Harper's Weekly covers. And that was, as I, I think mentioned before, one of the most widely read periodicals on the Civil War. And um, she's kind of ex you know, exploring some issues of race, gender, sexuality, oppression, all of that in the antebellum South and how they play out in stereotypes still today. So she uses new and old imagery, masking certain details, bringing others into focus, and uses positive and negative space so that you can see right through the heads of both of these people, um, loading a caravan for the white civilians who are getting ready to leave Atlanta. Anyway, so this is um, this is the last slide I have. I just wanted to, I know this probably did not help your um, genealogy efforts, but I, I hope you enjoyed what you saw and maybe got some ideas of different things like Rhode Island. Who would guess Rhode Island would be a good place to look at some Civil War records? Anyway, does anyone have any questions for me? You know, I know for thinking about my own ancestor, you know, I've sent away from my Civil War ancestors um, military file. And when I got it, um, it was pretty shocking uh, to read the condition he was left in after the war versus before the war. He went in a young man, he came out a damaged man. Um, he was actually forced uh, for some sort of a punishment I would assume uh, from his own side 
for doing something he shouldn't have done. He was forced to carry rocks in his backpack and it ruined his kidneys. And oh he had goodness. kidney he had kidney disorder the rest of his life um, because of the damage that the rocks on his backpack. And, and when I looked at the materials that he had been issued, like shoes, you know, boots yeah. and a canteen, um, it, it made me really appreciate how horrible it must have been for conditions, oh, yeah. you know, uh, you know, he had so little with him uh, on a day to day basis. And, you know, I can't imagine living with kidney damage while you're fighting a war. I mean, it just must have been horrendous. Oh, um, sure. I also I was also able to get his medical records. Um, so did amazing. you get those from the uh, National Archives or where yes, I got them from the National Archives? It, it took me quite a while to get them. Yeah, um, but it was, it's just shocking to see the damage, you know, all around that was done during the war. Yeah. Um, and we do just for the class interest. Um, we do have a wonderful book by, I believe it's William Dollarhide on how to find civil war records. Of course, the national archives is a great place to start, but uh, on a state level, there are amazing resources uh, available as well so if, if the class is interested in that book i can pull it up after your your presentation's over and we can go over that more but um civil war records are in some places obviously more plentiful than others you know so much was damaged in the south and a lot of records don't exist any longer in the south right. some do obviously and some don't but um it, it's it's really profound i don't think anyone in america no matter you know what race uh, color, creed. I mean, everyone was affected by the Civil War. Right. I mean, right. even here in Nevada, even though uh, we didn't become a state until uh, the Civil War was already in progress, um, Nevada didn't, we, of course, we did contribute some troops uh, through Fort Churchill in that area, but um, the war effort for the Civil War was more in the, the uh, silver and gold uh, in Virginia City, which helped fund the war, you know, so there, there was a funding of the war effort, but you know, clear across the country, um, you know, people were profoundly affected. Right, right. Where, where, what regiment was your relative in? Uh, give me a second. Let me pull up my ancestry tree. Uh, it was in New York. New York, yeah. Huh. Yeah, interesting. Have Have the rest of you had much success with Civil War records? I wanted to mention. I have. The... Oh, go ahead. Oh, thank you, George. Um, Yes, I pulled the pension records for uh, many Civil War people that served from Wisconsin. And, um, you know, I I have, I, luckily I have family who lives there in DC. So we visit and, and the, the NARA is always a place where I spend at least one day's time at. Uh, but you know, the, the, fo the uh, painting, not the painting, it was the woodcut of the uh, Rhode Island one with the carriage. Right. You look, you look at that man, and in today's world, you think PS, PTSD. Right, right. And they suffered such horrible experiences, you know, on battlefields and whatnot. And uh, having your arm amputated under those conditions was no picnic. And I, that was one of my favorite things that you showed. And um, I really appreciate this uh, presentation where it's not, genealogy focused entirely, but boy, it does give a different point of view when you're studying your Civil War ancestors. And I really appreciate it and thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I did want to, I forgot to uh, go further on this. I, I want, this was just a compilation of all the works that we looked at. And I was wondering if there was any one, and I guess for you, it was the uh, the empty sleeve. Um, does anybody else have another one that they particularly liked or found um, evocative of something? It showed the one picture of the people, I think it was in Maryland, who'd had their land or crops. Right. The land invasion. gone on to or invaded and all that. And it right. reminded me that there is there is a set of records. There was a commission established after, after the Civil War for people whose uh, property was taken and, you know, horses were taken sometimes and crops. It was called the Southern Claims Commission. And those records, I, you know, are, I guess, at National Archives, but they've been digitized and indexed by Ancestry. And I, even before that, I think there was a 
uh, hand, there was a, uh, a book with an index to those records. And originally you had to go to uh, National Archives to get them, but now, now they've been digitized. And I did, one of my ancestors, my great, great grandfather, who, as far as I know, he did not, he was, I think he was born in 1814 and lived in Mississippi. And uh, apparently he had some crops and horses or something confiscated. And so he filed a claim with them. So his, his claim is on record. And it's interesting to read, you know, um, you know, because they made them pay, fill out paperwork and sometimes the claims were approved, sometimes they were denied. Oh, so they were reimbursed to some some extent? Yes, yes. Some of the people whose whose property was taken, they were supposed to have been. Now, I don't know how much reimbursement, but there was a commission set up to review the claims, you know, once they were submitted and, you know, prove them or disprove them, to, you know, for those people whose property was taken. Right. Right. You know, which is kind of a lot of people don't know about that but and another thing you, you mentioned about um records um my um i did my ex-wife's family tree a number of years ago and she had a ancestor from new hampshire that served in the union army and i wrote off to the national archives to get his pension records oh. um and you still that's the only way that you can get the actual pension records is to go to the national archives they have not digitized there's too many of them but yeah. at any rate his was quite voluminous and it was interesting because um, he had like uh, affidavits uh, from friends uh, from friends from people he, who served in his unit and his, he was claiming a disability from suffering suffering from chronic diarrhea as a result of his service and well, <laughs> these affidavits were saying you know, I knew so and so, and he was in this regiment, and, and I knew he had to ease himself, you know, up to twelve times a day or whatever, kind of just corroborating his story of of how yeah. this happened, this occurred during the war, and it continued, but it didn't happen before the war. Uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I had the same thing. I I went to the National Archives, and I pulled my my great 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 grandfather's Civil War record. And I was amazed because he died three years after the war of dysentery. Oh. And it was he had had he got it while he was in the war and he had it all that time. Oh, poor guy. That's awful. He was really, I mean, he wasted away. And he too, that file too had affidavit after affidavit about his health and his well-being before and after the war. Wow. So it was, was very interesting. Was he compensated for any of that? Nope, he no. never was. In no. fact, the way it came out, my uh, great, great, great grandmother filed for his pension and she had to have an attorney in her hometown and she had to have an attorney in Washington, D.C. in order for the claim to be filed. Oh. They made her go through hell. It took so long that by the time the claim was approved, the one daughter died and oh she had my. to do it all over again. Oh no. And then after she did it all over again, it was approved, she remarried and she had to do it all over again. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, paperwork is great. <laughs> yeah, I, and it was really bad. It was, it was horrible. I'd like to comment about my ancestors' uh, Civil War records. Uh, I ap applied, you could say too early. And by that, I mean, it was about 2001 when I applied for my first set of records. And um, I got caught in one of those revolving door things. Mm. At, up, up until more recently, and I'm not sure exactly what year this changed, because by then I had gotten the records that I was interested in. But uh, it turned out that if you had a Civil War veteran who died after um, 1903, their records were in the custody of the Veterans Administration. Yeah. Now, uh, they were actually physically in the National Archives, but the Veterans Administration controlled them. So the when I first wrote for them, the archives told me what the file number was and told me to go to the Veterans Administration. Well, I did that five times wow. and uh, I couldn't get anywhere. So finally, the uh, docent at the National Archives in San Bruno gave me a copy of the page out of the government phone book 
for the head of the um, Veterans Administration in Oakland. And I called and got his assistant and explained my tale of woe. And they eventually got the records for me. It took 22 months. Wow. And wow. So, then, so then I laid off for a year because I had another grandfather that I wanted to get his records for. And I wrote directly to the guy that had helped me before and he was no longer there. And every time I uh, contacted them, oh, the guy would say, well, fill them out and send them to me personally. And I did. And I would never hear from him. Oh. So I didn't mess around anymore with that one. I went directly to the uh, VA again and explained my tale of woe. It didn't help because in the meantime, I had contacted my congresswoman's office and oh. the Veterans Administration was telling her representative one thing, which I knew to be wrong. And he stopped taking my calls. So finally, between the Veterans Administration, uh, they went to my congresswoman and she had the records sent to me uh, for my uh, grandfather and for my father who was in World War II. And where my father was concerned, they called me up, up one day and they said, I've got your grandfather's medals. And I said, what medals? And they, so they told me, and I said, so that's my father. So I went down there and there were two uh, envelopes with all kinds of medals in them, probably about, well, several hundred dollars worth of medals that I hadn't asked for. But I've put them to good use. But that's beside the point. Oh, my uh, goodness. Anyway, this took about another 21 months to get settled. Now, I'm telling you the sad tale of woe because the law changed after I went through all this. And it's different now when you ask for records. And they have a whole, a whole different set of criteria than they had when I did it. But... And the case of the first one, I got a binder that is an inch thick that went from the end of the Civil War until his death in, in um, well, actually until his wife's death in 1941. And then the other one, um, I didn't get quite as many documents uh, because uh, he didn't have as many problems as my, my first ancestor. But that's yeah. the kind of trial and tribulation you can go through. Yeah, it, it, I, am, I admire your persistence. It's really something. It's not persistence. It's downright stubbornness. <laughs> I and, want... and I looked up my Civil War ancestor. He was in the 35th Infantry Company I in New York. Ah, okay, good. So, and you were able to find a fair amount on him? Yes, the, the National Archives sent me a wonderful file. In fact, I, I got so into it after I read his file that I sent away for his brother's file, who also fought in the Civil War. Different, a different company, uh, but uh, you know they mustered in at the same place, but different company. Right. I did want to, uh, I sent this file to Suzanne if she'd like to share it with you. Um, I did want to just give you a, a quick study on how to read these things. So I, I didn't mention, I don't think, that this Underground Railroad was a mural study for a New York post office uh, done in the 40s. So most of the works I showed you were from the Civil War period, except for, um, I guess, the, the visit from the old mistress, which came, uh, what, 11 years after the war, and then the Carol Walker, which was from 2005. But al almost everything else is right from the Civil War, except and also for this one, because it was. So just to read these, this is the title. It tells you the date, the artist, what it's made out of, and how it got here. So this one was a transfer from the Internal Revenue Service through the General Services Administration. And then this number at the end shows when it was acquired by the museum. So again, I'll do another one. View on the James River this was an unidentified author. We don't have a date, uh, but we know it's a wood engraving. It gives you, sometimes it gives you the um, measurements and then what year it was acquired. So if you're, if you're interested in, in any of these, you know, by all means, take a look at that. 
And then this is my last, my very last slide that I just, if you'd like to look at more artwork and you can sort these out, if you, if you go to the art and artists, this part right here, and click on that, a search window will open up and it'll say basic or advanced. And under the advanced, you can search by years. They have a, a range of years that you can search by. You can search by topic. You can search by artist or title, uh, all kinds of things. But it, this is all free. So all you have to do is uh, log on to this AmericanArt.si for Smithsonian.edu. So you can spend a lot of time looking through this. Not, you know, I don't know if that would help you, but it's a, a fun way to spend some time. And this particular paint, uh, this artwork here, I don't know if you've been to Washington, but this is a huge, uh, I think it's, I don't know, it's, it's a huge whole wall kind of artwork and it's made up of televisions and neon lights. It's a map of the United States and it has videos from every single state so that New York is like the, Empire State Building and Kentucky is the uh, Kentucky Derby and Idaho is all potatoes and they, you know they have different things that represent each state to this artist. So this is kind of our signature piece that people comment on all the time. So if there are no other questions, I will leave you to your discussions, but I enjoyed working with you today and I hope you've picked up something that might be of use for your further endeavors. I have a question. Sure. <clears throat> Several years ago, I was taking a road trip through Wyoming and I stopped, I believe it was in Carson, and there was a wonderful, huge museum there that had a fabulous collection of Western art. And I'm wanting to say that it was part of the Smithsonian. Am I remembering correctly? I don't think so. The Smithsonian is made up of 19 museums and the zoo. Um, most of them are in Washington, but there are a couple, I think the Cooper, Cooper Union design, or uh, I forget, there's a design one and an American Indian one in New York, but all the rest are in Washington. Now we do work collaboratively with a lot of museums around the country. We, we trade and swap and um, borrow artworks back and forth for various ex exhibitions, but I don't think that that one would be part of the Smithsonian as a whole. I gotta find out who it was. It's one of the best museums I've been to. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, that sounds really interesting. I'd like to get a chance to go there. Oh, trust me, you, and give yourself more than an afternoon, which is what I did. Yeah. I uh, killed myself uh, racing through that place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay and uh, we'll give the class a few more moments to see if there's any other questions. Okay. And while, while we're waiting for anyone to ask one final last question, I want to remind the class that uh, the class is going to go on after our guest speaker is over with today. But if you do choose to leave at this point in time, uh, please download the chat box if there's anything in there that you are interested in uh, preserving. And Anne, thank you very much for giving us uh, permission to record. It will take our marketing department quite a bit of time, several months probably before they get it up on the um, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, but when they do, I will let you know uh, and uh, you can watch it if you'd like. Okay. Uh, and also I want to remind everybody, um, I did find the record of William Dollar Hyde's book. Uh, we do have it in our library. Uh, it is a reference uh, book, so you cannot check it out, but you can certainly come in and, and uh, uh, use the scanning machine to copy the pages that are of interest to you. Uh, and I did put that in the chat box. If you'd like to purchase your own copy through Amazon, the link is in there. So class, any last minute questions for Anne? Okay. Okay. Anne. okay, well, thank you very much. I enjoyed working with you and have a good holiday season and uh, enjoy your further delving into your genealogy. Well, thank you, Anne. And thank you so much for being our guest today. Sure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.